Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening to the members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and also to all the others that who have gathered here for the, our very first webinar out of the series of webinars that are going to be organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this year 2021. I very warmly welcome all of you for this webinar series. Uh, today's webinar would be on this, the mostly needed topic in today's complex, uh, today's context, uh, as we are in the verge of the COVID, the community spread of COVID-19. And I think that many of us would be interested in learning on this new concept of biobubble in the new normal for an active, safe and productive engagement. The, uh, we have three, organized three eminent speakers to address this most needed areas of this, this topic. And uh, let me now invite our moderator, Dr. Sajit Vikramasinghe, to uh, commence the proceedings. Sajit, over to you. Right. Uh, thank you, madam. So today, uh, our first speaker will be the Dr. Uh, Inoka Suravira, uh, who is a consultant community physician from Ministry of Health. So she will be talking uh, to us about what is a biobubble and what are the experiences from what we have gained uh, from the industrial and the apparel sector. So over to Dr. Inoka Suravira. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Madam President for giving me this opportunity to speak about this very timely topic. Uh, so as we see, my topic for today is what is a biobubble experience from the industrial apparel sector. What is a biobubble really? So if we just think of a bubble, we will understand that it has a secure environment and it is enclosed or which is cut off or sealed from the outside world. So we have inside a bubble, we have a secure environment which is cut off or sealed from the outside world. So since we are talking about a bio bubble, now bubbles can be water bubbles, soap bubbles, or anything. Now here we are talking about bio bubble. So basically, bio bubbles consist of humans. And we need to understand that this is accessible only by an approved set of people. So these people, when they are in the bubble, will not have physical contact with the outside world. So that is basically the idea of establishing or forming a bio bubble. We need to have a group of people who are inside a bubble so that they can work, they can, uh, they can work, they can live, and they can accomplish a certain given task safely. So why biobubbles bio during this COVID-19 pandemic? Now we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has disturbed all sectors and all walks of life. But we can't go on like this. We need to resume activities. We need to engage in sports. We need to keep the industries moving. We need to have the schools So likewise. We, in the new normal, of course, we need to find a way of resuming and functioning amidst this COVID-19 outbreak. So in fact, this bubble concept was introduced initially in sports, especially in cricket. I think when they um, initially uh, designed this IPL series, they used this bio-bubble concept. And lately, when we did the guidelines for the LPL cricket also, we use the same concept. So why is it used? Because this concept really can help to minimize the risk of contracting disease, COVID-19, 
when you are inside a bubble, yet you can function to achieve a particular task. So it, it has been applied widely in sports, especially cricket and other games, as well as it has been now applied in other sectors, which needs functioning uh, even amidst COVID-19 outbreak without any interruption. And we have several examples and success stories from different sectors in Sri Lanka as well. So how is this bio bubble created? So usually now a bio bubble is created to accomplish some kind of a task. It can be sports, it can be industrial sector uh, functionality. So uh, that is, there has to be some objective. So a group of people, they are chosen to enter this bubble. And of course, they will be physically interacting and socializing together inside this bubble environment. So what we have understood is if you just keep this group small, the effectiveness is really enhanced. But when you have bigger numbers inside these bubbles, certain contamination can happen. So therefore, we all know that small numbers would be better. But certainly, we can always adjust uh, this uh, situation according to what we need to achieve. So usually this group of people, persons, before they enter this bubble, it is very much necessary to make sure that they are free from COVID-19. So different protocols are followed, especially testing procedures with PCRs and all. And usually, it is understood and it is ensured that they are free from COVID-19 before they enter the bubble. So they will accomplish the task given. They will live within this bubble. They will travel within this bubble. They will uh, have accommodation within this bubble. And of course, uh, once the task given is accomplished, the bubble can be dispersed. But we need to understand that if there is any contamination, that person has to come out of the bubble. And certainly, of course, as we uh, know right now, these uh, contaminated persons, again, will have to be removed from the bubble. So no others will be allowed in a particular bubble to enter till the objective is achieved. So all inside the bubble need to be trustworthy. And of course, they need to be accountable and united for its optimal function. So these are some of the principles which we have used in designing different activities using this bubble concept. So now let me think about the industrial or the apparel sector, how we have used this bubble concept to keep them going without any interruption. So what is the importance of the industrial sector? Why do we need to? apply different methodologies to see that they function without any interrupt. Now, we have to understand that COVID-19 is a huge health battle, but it's not only a health battle, but certainly it is an economic battle too. So we need to very clearly understand that. Business continuity and resilience is very much essential during this pandemic. So we need to strengthen the economy, even though we are amidst this COVID-19 pandemic, and we need to grow economically. 
Of course, we have other objectives like you know the sustainable development. And in that sense, of course, in that sense, industries become very important. They are functionality without interruption. Now, we know that industrial sector, especially the board of investment industries, we have so many zones in Sri Lanka, and there are like you know 280 BOI industries inside the zone. And outside zones also, there are around 1,600 industries owned by the Board of Investments. So they really contribute to the economy of Sri Lanka. So we thought of strategies. We, 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 in fact, we need to think strategically of how to see and how to strengthen the economy. So that is why we applied this biobubble concept into the industrial sector so that they could function without uh, much interaction. Now, so uh, of course, you can see uh, the, the gross export earnings, which are uh, contributed from this new investment. So actually, it's very important to keep them functioning without interruption. So, um, of course, now we all understand the importance of uh, keeping the industries moving. Okay, so the importance, we need to continue the functionality of industries. Why? Because the contribution to the economy is huge and also they provide a lot of jobs. On the other hand, the risk for COVID-19 among industrial sector employees is significantly higher. Why? Because there are large numbers of workers working in confined areas and also certain factors or certain working practices, the nature of the work practices, actually they will, uh, they, they will uh, not favor the basic simple measures that we want them to practice for COVID-19 prevention. So therefore the risk is high, as well as their importance is very much uh, in terms of strengthening the economy. So we thought we need to introduce this bubble concept so that they can keep on functioning. So actually the goal of the industrial sector is to have COVID-19 free workplaces. However, if infected workers in this context, of course, now see there is a high chance of finding infected workers. So if infected or if uh, workers with COVID-19 positivity is found in workplaces in industrial sector, to identify them at the initial stage as well as to contain them as soon as possible. And also especially to minimize the close contact of first-line contact as much as possible. Now I will explain to you why this is very much essential. Because as per the guidelines, what we have given to the industrial sector, once a positive worker is found in a workplace, you need to identify the first line contact. So, and then of course, what we have advised is to remove the first line contact as, and to get them uh, as per the current uh, uh, quarantine protocol to get them uh, for quarantine. And of course, these industries can function with the second line contacts, of course, under closed monitoring. So if you minimize the first line contact as much as possible, then the chances of that industry to function is much more. So that is why we introduce this bio bubble concept to the industrial sector. Merely to see that we don't have many first lines so that they can function with the second line. So we introduce this bio bubble, bio secure bubble concept to the industrial as well as apparel sector. But we need to understand here it is not a full bio bubble. It is a modified biobubble because, as I mentioned, 
bio bubble in its uh, uh, actually true sense has to be an enclosed group of people. But when it comes to apparel sector and industrial sector, we can't have that practice. So we can have it to a certain extent, but of course, we can't have a full bio bubble practice inside industrial sector. Again, the aim is for less mixing. So application of modified bio bubble concept in industrial sector. Now, in an industry, in an enterprise, there are different sections. Especially for large industries, they provide transportation. And of course, we have the operation floor, the plant, where so many operations happen. That again is a significant area in any industry. And of course, we have the meal room. Meal rooms are very vulnerable. Why? Because they are super spreading places. And of course, uh, in an industry, again, you have the washrooms, locker rooms. So what we did was we took all these areas and designed this modified bio bubble. Transportation, operational flow, and of course, meal rooms, washrooms. What we did was we took took the same group of persons considering all these areas to be in the same bubble. So if any contamination happens, only a group of people or group of employees are going to be affected. Since there is no mixing with the other bubble, still, of course, the industry can function. So an enterprise can have several modified bio bubbles depending on the number of employees that they have. Plants which have large numbers, they have so many bubbles inside. But the principle is these bubbles don't mix together. And of course, now we need to understand how these industries function. So they have shifts. So a particular shift will consist of different bubbles, so many bubbles. And if you consider a shift as a bubble, there is no mixing between these two shifts. So that is how we have applied this concept to reduce the mixing, thereby reducing contamination as well as slide content. Now, how did we apply? So first of course, the bubbles, they need some identification. So these bands have been designed and each bubble has been given, each modified bubble has been given a different color code. So these group of workers, employees, belonging to a particular bu bubble will have a particular color, red, green, yellow, blue, so on. So now how did we do this when it comes to transportation of workers? So dedicated seats for each employee in the bubble. So a particular group of employees in a certain bubble, they will have dedicated transport for that group. And even in the transportation, what we have done is we have found out dedicated seats so that one employee will always sit on a particular seat. Why did we do it? Again, to have less fixing. So therefore, if that worker becomes positive, he will not, or he or she will not have a lot of first line contacts because then we can easily identify the first line contacts. We remove them, get them for the quarantine protocol, 
and then not force still not force within the bubble they can function so this is actually from one of the plants where they have implemented this you can see that they have this physical barrier between even two seats so the employee number is there on the seat and then they make sure that a particular employee within a bubble sits on the same place uh, in in a, in the particular vehicle so operational flow in the bubble again now when it comes to apparel sector you will understand that they have uh, different places like you know they have machines so a dedicated place for all employees within a bubble was designed and now this is being practiced any worker any employee will have a dedicated place so that that person comes and sits on the same place but earlier of course this was not the practice within the bubble they have a dedicated place to sit so even with that what we have done is the ice is lifted even the worker becomes positive then of course the first lines are very much less but if this person was like you know sitting everywhere even the whole bubble can be contained so this again is a uh, 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 photos, of course, now uh, showing how they have done in actual uh, workplaces or enterprises. So you see the physical barriers, uh, and then of course each one is given a dedicated and meal room. So again, they have done this physical barriers. Now this one, of course, having six thousand workers in that particular plant. so dedicated place for all employees and they have done the scheduling of meal times so only a, a group of persons belonging to a particular bubble would come for the meals and then they have dedicated place so therefore again it has reduced mixing so now you can see here uh, as per the shifts also the employee numbers are given and then they have this dedicated places to sit so with all these things actually these enterprises they have managed to reduce the number of first line contacts and even if they get the positive one still of course their functionality would not be affected when it comes to the washrooms again dedicated for a particular bubble you have a dedicated washroom so only employees in that particular bubble would be allowed to use these washrooms now if the yellow group can uh, is dedicated uh, a washroom then of course the blue group cannot come to this washroom so that is being monitored so there is strict monitoring and this has ensured uh, the efficient functioning of these bubbles and with less mixing so actually we need to understand the benefits of having these uh, concepts uh, into practice of course this is going to benefit the employees because there is no disruption of uh, uh, their work practices and certainly families because you know they will the, the job security would be there the factories will not have to be closed the management enterprises as well as districts why because you know we need to have job opportunities villages as well as a country because we need to have these industries functioning if we are to strengthen the economy of this country so business resilience and continuity when you apply this bio bubble concept of course the modified bio bubble concept less expenses for testing because we have experience now when there are positive workers if there are lot of mixing certainly you will have uh, so many first line contacts and even so they have to be tested and then uh, just to mention uh, i think the board of investment they have spent like over 425 million for testing during this covid pandemic so it actually a lot of uh, money so if you apply this of course you will have less expenses for testing stigma stigma is a big problem as we all know these industrial workers they 
are faced with a lot of stigma. Sometimes their children cannot be sent to schools. Why? If the, uh, the teachers and the principals, when they come to know that a certain enterprise has positive employees, they will not let children from that uh, uh, enterprise, the parents, if their parents are working in that enterprise group, even come to school. So that is actually a big problem. Letting others live when earn, because sometimes when you have like, you know, a disaster in an enterprise, then that will affect other employees as well, especially the informal economy workers. Now, see, we uh, experienced all these things during the past few months. So certainly when you apply and when you keep the industries functioning, it will certainly strengthen the economy of the country. And of course, we need to understand when we apply these uh, concepts, we will give hope for our elders. They will live and they will not they, 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 they will not have to sacrifice their lives due to this COVID-19 because of course if the industries they are practicing these things, the chances of getting infected as well as spreading it to the community becomes very much less. So there is going to be more hope for our elders. Also hope for our youth. They need to resume their education. They need to uh, sort of, you know, go to the universities. So if we can have the industries intact and if we, the industries are not, not a source of uh, infection, especially COVID-19, we can give hope for our youth. And not only that, hope for our children because they need to go to school. They can't we, we can't have the schools closed uh, throughout. And if we sort of apply these concepts to the industrial sector, certainly they will not be a source of uh, disaster uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. So we can be for father children as well. So with all those things in mind only, we applied uh, this biobubble concept, of course, the modified biobubble concept in the industrial and apparel sector. And I'm very happy because I see so many of the large industries uh, complying with these things and then they have adopted these concepts and uh, they, they are functioning without any interruption. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suravira. Uh, for that excellent presentation. So before moving on to the next present, uh, presenter, I would like to make a small announcement. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put it on the chat or uh, raise your hands at the end of all three presentations. So we'll be having our question discussion at the end of all three presentations. Uh, so now we'll move on to the second presenter. To introduce the second presenter, I would like to invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President SLMA. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Sajid. Uh, our second speaker would be addressing biobubble concept for cricket experience from the LPL. Uh, he is not anyone new to the audience. He is Vidya Jyoti, Senior Professor Arjuna De Silva, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Over to you, Arjuna. Thank you, uh, Madam, for that uh, introduction. And uh, if I can have the slides on this. So I think that, uh, the first lecture is very good because uh, just moved. That was uh, the idea launching pad for my talk, which will be totally on cricket. And uh, so this is the biosecure bubble concept for cricket, the experience from the LPL and subsequently the two test matches, not two test matches, two test series. So next slide. Uh, so why? COVID-19 stopped sports around the world and even it cancelled the Olympics. So we definitely needed to restart sports around the world. So next slide. Uh, so England, it's a bit debatable who actually invented this in sports. So the England hosted West Indies and they started the biobubble in cricket. Definitely, there is no doubt about that. Around about the same time, the NBA had their own biobubble. Uh, again, in the same time, and 
they successfully had the series. Both were to uh, closed doors. That means there were no fans. So we were the first to have uh, the bio secure bubble in Asia. Though India had the IPL, they didn't have it in South Asia. They had to go to Dubai to hold uh, the thing. So we can be happy that we were the first uh, country in South Asia to have this year bubble for uh, cricket. Next one. So where did we have this? Well, the first uh, I, uh, LPL was held at Hambantura Mahind Rajapaksa Stadium. Uh, it's a lovely place. And then Shang we used uh, uh, the Shangri-La Hotel, Anantara and uh, the Elephant Reach Hotel. So how? Uh, this is the sort of concept of the bio bubble, bio secure bubble. So uh, as uh, the first speaker uh, illustrated, there are different, different bubbles. So the ground is one bubble, the hotel is one bubble, and inside that you have smaller bubbles. So the whole idea is once the inside the bubble you're sterile uh, to say that there is no covid inside the bubble next so this is hard work uh, that's what's important because uh, first we met with the sri lanka cricket then the minister of sports then with the ministry of health uh, the, the dg secretary epid unit uh, we had a lot of discussions with them then we went to meet uh, the COVID task force and His Excellency the President. Our main aim was to reduce the quarantine period from 14 to 7 days because most of the international cricketers were not happy to stay 14 days in the room. So that was practically difficult to do. Oh, I must, although New Zealand is somehow managing to pull that off, we, we found that we needed a practical approach. Next slide. So uh, the ministry was very kind and they gave us the guidelines. So we had different, different bubbles that players, coach uh, in one bubble, one, and then the production crew, sponsors, uh, media crew, match officials, ICC officials in different bubbles. So, so as if one person gets uh, positive, that minimizes the uh, contamination of the others. Next slide. So this is a, a flow chart to show uh, what we had because we had our local players and we had our foreign players coming. Uh, so they had to have two PCRs done within 72 hours, uh, 24 hours apart. Uh, that is before arrival. And the locals had to have two PCRs again before checking in. So the foreigners had PCRs on arrival at the airport. The locals, when they checked in. So an important thing here is that we found repeatedly is that our PCR at the airport was very, very important because even though some people, some players were been playing in different leagues, they came uh, with so many negative PCRs, but our PCR, we had two players uh, who were positive on our PCR. Uh, so we luckily we uh, caught them immediately, uh, at least on arrival. So that's important. Then they were quarantined in their room for three days. They had another PCR on the fourth day. And if that was negative, they could start practicing in small groups, again, uh, within the hotel. Then on, they had a PCR on day six, and if that was negative, they could start practicing as a team. Uh, and then after the day nine PCR, they were, uh, if they were negative, they were allowed to play against another team. So basically 10 days on. So after they started playing, uh, we reduced the PCR to every three days. Uh, and after 14 days, we went on to every five days. So our system did work quite well. And 
in the bubble after we detected the first two cases, we did not have any positive cases. Next slide. So when you talk about the players, they must be disciplined to be in a bubble. We have to educate them. We have to gain their trust because something new. And transparency is something very, very important, especially if you deal with foreign teams. Because if you hide something and you get it on media or social media, they will not trust you. So the trust is important. As soon as you have information, you must share it. And you have to support the players. That's very, very important. Next, Next one. So these are a few things of the uh, players arriving. This is uh, on the left side the LPL, uh, and uh, British Airways charter flight coming, uh, charter flight coming in, uh, especially to bring the England team. And here you can see them at, they came in at Mathala, and they were very, very impressed. They have actually written and said that they've never seen uh, anywhere in the world, people coming with hazmat suits to greet them in an airport, which is absolutely empty and it was there only for them. Them. So they had just come out of South Africa halfway during the tour. Next slide. So there was a big medical team. That's another very, very important point to remember. Uh, so me and medic, Dr. Daminda, Dr. Kirial, Dr. Prasad was the army. So we had the army played a big role in helping to maintain this uh, biosecure bubble. Each team in the IPL, LPL had a team doctor. So there are five teams, five doctors. Uh, each hotel had an army doctor who looked after the hotel. And there was a separate match day doctor uh, as well. Then we had uh, to have the cooperation with the RDHS, the MOH of the area, the EPID unit. We had a lot of uh, discussions with Dr. Hasita Disera and myself. The DG, uh, I used to trouble him quite a lot. And the secretary and finally the Ministry of Health as well. So we have to access people uh, to make decisions during this thing. It's not a smooth run, though the end result seems smooth. The next slide, please. So the hotel staff, again, important. They are tested on a similar protocol, not as extensive as the players, but they are tested as well. They will remain in the bubble at all times. That means they will uh, not go out. Uh, they will have minimum contact with the players. And when they do, they will be in PPE. Next slide. So the security of the bubble was maintained by... Uh, the Sri Lanka army and the inner perimeter by army commandos. Next one. So we use bridges. Uh, they are called bridges. Sterile bridges are used to communicate between bubbles. Because, for instance, from the hotel, when they want to go uh, to uh, the ground, they are taken in a sterile bus. So the driver also is in the bubble. Uh, they, there is social distancing in the bus and they are taken to the ground. Uh, if anyone has to enter the bubble, they can enter only uh, in full PP. And England used a chartered flight to come from London to Sri Lanka. We used a chartered flight to come uh, from uh, South Africa to Sri Lanka. Next one. So the grounds, uh, unfortunately, the grounds were closed. So there were no spectators. There were clearly designated zones. The ground staff had their own bubble. They were tested regularly. There were separate dressing rooms for the players and separate entrances. So if you breach the bubble, uh, luckily we didn't have any cases like that. Uh, there is, a, you get a seven day uh, quarantine and you have to, get two negative PCRs before you come in. Uh, Geoffrey Archer in England, the initial bubble, he got fined as well uh, for breaching the bubble. So you have to have very strict rules there. Next one. So this is a picture of the intermediate care facility because one of the main worries about the cricketers was uh, 
what happens if you're positive? They, they definitely said they can't stay in a normal uh, government hospital, which was the thing. So then we came up with the intermediate care facility, which has now, uh, so a lot of things that came out of this have come positive and we are using in normal life as well. Uh, after this bio intermediate care facility, a lot of hotels have been now uh, used like this. So this was the intermediate care facility we used in Gaul. And as you know, I, I actually, as a physician, I don't like uh, showing uh, patients, but uh, unfortunately the media had a field day. This was the first patient who was positive. Again, he was positive on arrival. So he stayed there. Next slide. So we used lateral flow tests or basically antigen testing uh, back, yeah, uh, because that's useful on arrival. That's something you can use in tourism as well. You do the PCR from one nostril, you do the uh, antigen from the other nostril, and you immediately identify the player who is uh, infected. Uh, yeah. because that's important yeah. because when you're going in a bus together otherwise you'll have to isolate all the players so when you do the uh, antigen test and the PCR uh, at the same time that's useful so there are many issues in the biosecure bubble it is hard for the players they don't see their family for months they don't see anyone else uh, it is expensive PCR testing alone is close to 20 million for all these uh, things. The psychological support is needed. Uh, England tour, so we allow the players to bring their families in. And there are so many other issues which came across as well. It's very important to know that uh, when you're dealing with the biosecure bubble, you have to put a lot of work in and you need a large amount of medical input. That's very, very import, important. It's, it needs extensive planning and a lot of hard work. The adequate medical personnel, and you have to communicate regularly with everyone. Uh, that's very, very important. And test, 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 yes. Uh, yes, despite, despite all this, we had to have our normal health things like wearing face masks whenever possible. Sometimes, of course, in the bubble, you can uh, release that. But otherwise, keep your physical distance, wash your hands, don't touch your face. Uh, all that you have to uh, adhere to. And finally, the final message, last slide, please. I think this is very important to us as medics. Uh, yes, so mask up, distance, hand hygiene, and vaccine. So vaccine is on its way. Uh, to all healthcare uh, frontline workers, good news from tomorrow, the vaccine will be there. So remember, science will win, as Stephen Hawking said, because it works. So we will win if we follow science, right? which has been shown by the vaccine, which unprecedentedly was developed in uh, less than a year. So science will ultimately win. So we have to get rid of all the myths and uh, other this uh, false hopes, false beliefs. As scientists, we should stand up against all that. And remember the words of Stephen Hawking, one of the best, greatest scientists in this modern era. Science will win because it works. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So I would like to rem uh, remind another small announcement. So if you have uh, questions, please send us uh, through the chat so our speakers can uh, reply. And also we will uh, direct the questions at the end of this session. So we'll move on to the last speaker. Uh, she is Mrs. Dhammika Vijay Singha, who is the Director General, Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority. So she will be talking today on biobubble concept for international tourism. Over to, uh, over to Mrs. Vijay Singha. Good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me to um, this uh, mostly 
medical professionals webinar uh, uh, tourism industry is uh, another uh, very important component of the economy of sri lanka it uh, it used to be the third highest uh, foreign exchange earner and uh, direct employment is about 300000 but over 3 million over 3 million people depend on tourism therefore uh, there were a lot of constraints to reopen tourism but we had to uh, do it somehow and uh, yeah preparing for uh, reopening tourism wasn't an easy journey for us so we were benchmarking conceptualizing developing all kind of uh, method and strategies this uh, this included a lot of uh, coordination with the ministry of health uh, i must thank uh, the team including uh, dr hasith dr hemant uh, dr harsha and dr anand so uh, everybody like gave their input and uh, we had a lot of discussion argument disappointment then how somehow uh, we had the discussions with the uh, medical uh, medical professional then the with the tourism industry partners like um, the hoteliers the tour uh, travel agents to operators the guides the tourist drivers everybody and they had, uh, they they were facing different issues so uh, this uh, tourism industry tourism and travel if we take together is uh, one area that uh, a lot of people lost their jobs during the uh, covid pandemic they either lost their jobs or they lost their income and uh, so we were looking at uh, what the other other uh, similar countries like um, thailand uh, maldives dubai uh, and other countries were doing so we tried to um, study their uh, their strategies and try to um, incorporate them into our planning then uh, this concept had somehow to be tested so um, this pilot project the uh, so called the pilot project was uh, actually forced on us uh, before we were even ready for it and uh, therefore um, we had to undergo some difficulties with that but then uh, that was uh, the pilot project started on the 28th of december and it was the 21st of december we got the first uh, health guideline signed by the uh, director general of health for this particular pilot project but then uh, there were again uh, more discussions and that was uh, again uh, amended and issued on the 27th one day before the arrival of the first group so uh, anyway we had the pilot project and then um, the government announced that the government is going to open the country for tourism that is under some restrictions but open the country for tourists that was uh, closed for 10 months almost since last march 2020 and uh, we had a lot of preparation to do for this so we developed e brochures uh, printed brochures of the health guideline we simplified them so that the stakeholders could uh, understand them better so I had a lot of uh, coordination and discussion with the missions the airlines international media and the general public then now uh, we developed some information flyers for the international travelers accommodation providers travel agents tour guides and tourist drivers and we are in the process of developing uh, more information uh, brochures for the general public uh, and 
we uh, this was actually suggested by dr susi that we need to uh, have a local media promotion because especially because the first sri lankan who uh, was uh, detected with uh, covid-19 was a tour guide and the first person who passed away was a tour guide therefore there was a kind of stem, uh, like a stigma against the tourism industry and uh, a fear kind of when they see a white skin most of the people had this uh, covid uh, fear therefore um, we developed this uh, the local media campaign which is uh, on the move at the moment and then we developed some videos uh, health safety protocol videos with animation and then uh, the brochures and all that so we had a lot of webinars and discussions with the the uh, foreign missions and um, two operators to prepare the tourists international travelers before uh, they even uh, started planning to come to sri lanka uh, then uh, of course we had uh, special uh, meetings with the key markets uh, but of course uh, one of our key markets uk is uh, closed at the moment but uh, then most of the others we had uh, meetings and uh, discussions uh, with them what what do we tell our international visitor so we simplified the health guidelines that has been issued for us how to prepare a menu uh, plan to visit sri lanka the, the whether they have a minimum stay with uh, what are the pcr tests they have to take prior boarding as well as uh, within the country what are the activities that they will be uh, allowed to do and the, whether there is a quarantine period or how it happens here and uh, in this planning uh, uh, we uh, we used a lot of lessons that learn we learned through the pilot project we realized that there were uh, lapses in information sharing because the the first time the the visitors through the charter plane came they uh, they were not wearing masks so we had to at the airport hand hand over some mask for them and uh, prepare them according to our guidelines so th- even though we were having discussions with most of the industry partners this particular group of people well they were not informed of the protocols that are practiced in sri lanka then uh, the lack of understanding of stakeholder resp- responsibilities because the it was clearly mentioned that the hotels and the uh, to uh, to travel agents uh, were responsible uh, for the safety and the uh, the security of the staff, the staff as well as the tourists international tourists but then um, we observed that uh, they planned an excursion to yala without informing the authorities they got the approval and then uh, they just took off so we had to intervene with the assistance of the covid task force and the uh, army and uh, because the quarantine facilities or oh, the was not uh, arranged for the drivers so it there was a risk of breaching the bubble and uh, we realized there are a uh, system shortcomings and then we are of course in tourism it is uh, unlike uh, other industries there are expectations of the visitors and during a pandemic uh, such as covid pandemic how much can we deliver out of those expectations then uh, we realized that there were uh is a testing and reporting gaps because we have been uh, given this five labs by the uh, ministry of health and uh, we were working with them but uh, some of the labs 
provided their uh, reports within 20, uh, like 24 hours, but uh, some lab took uh, more than uh, 36 hours or sometimes 48 hours. Then uh, this created some unrest among the visitors because uh, the guideline was uh, that after the first negative PCR test, they were permitted to visit certain identified and approved uh, sites within the bubble. So the, the longer the period for the test results, uh, there were some uh, issues among the guests. And then uh, with the particular uh, pilot project, we had some uh, reluctance uh, to adhere to our guidelines. Uh, this uh, created uh, some uh, issues, so we had to um, get the highest level of policy making in, involved so that uh, they were forced to uh, abide by the guidelines uh, given. Then uh, the staff management difficulties, because uh, unlike in uh, uh, the other places, uh, other industries, this, this is 24 hour operation. So the staff has to be there and if you are keeping the uh, entire staff at the hotel and then uh, after a group of tourists leave, then they have to be quarantined for 14 days. So for the four, that 14 days, they can't operate. Uh, those are the issues faced by the uh, hoteliers. And then uh, the external interferences, which uh, it is still happening that uh, certain parties try to influence and try to breach the bubble in. And uh, what are the constraints with the tourism bio bubble? In tourism, uh, why do tourists come to Sri Lanka? They come to Sri, Sri Lanka either to uh, see the scenic beauty or uh, enjoy the uh, food, enjoy the uh, wellness, the medical uh, tourism, or the adventure, the nature. Can we do it within a hotel? No, we can't. So we have to go out. And uh, then there are certain famous tourist sites uh, which are not in the permitted activities. Only 17 uh, sites are at the moment permitted. And uh, there are a lot of uh, requests that certain places like Alla uh, to be included in this, but uh, due to the fact that there could be interactions with the, the Sri Lankan community, uh, it has not been allowed so far. Then another issue is the uh, available number of rooms. Because uh, when we were preparing for the tourism reopening, this started far back as May, June last year, we uh, developed these operational guidelines for uh, tourism service providers with the Ministry of Health. So we went into different uh, processes, activities that would be part of the tourism and developed guidelines for uh, the hoteliers, for travel agents, for the drivers, for the site managers, all, all the stakeholders in the industry. Then for the hoteliers to uh, ensure that they are uh, abiding the guidelines and uh, conforming to them, we identified, uh, we selected some independent audit companies to conduct an audit on conformity and then uh, certify them as safe and secure. So far, only uh, 144 hotels have been uh, certified as safe and secure with a uh, total of uh, 8,850 rooms. But out of them, now, uh, this is something that you have to identify. Like, there are 
very um, strict guidelines for a level one hotel. What is a level one hotel? Level one hotel is a safe and secure hotel that is willing to accept only uh, international travelers uh, during any given time. So they can't have banquets, they can't entertain uh, domestic tourists. So out of the 144 safe and secure certified hotels, only 49 hotels opted to become level one. So this, uh, this is uh, this constitute about 2,342 rooms, out of which we have to uh, allocate 25% for isolation purposes, which leaves us with 1,756 rooms. So uh, we are operating under severe limited capacity. So what are the pain points from the uh, point of view of an international traveler. So they come to Sri Lanka to enjoy the country to, well, that, that, is, that includes uh, interactions with people because Sri Lanka is a country that is famous for its hospitality, the warmth, the smile. But you can't see the smiles. Your faces are covered and you can't interact with the people. So you can't exactly experience that warmth or the hospitality. So, yes, so until 14 days, they have to stay within this bubble and then only they can uh, move out to the community. But uh, most of the, like, the average stay is uh, 10 to 12 days. But uh, most of the uh, visitors currently are opting to stay longer than 14 days because they want to go out into the community. Another uh, uh, pain point is that the static nature of their stay. Is, uh, they are allowed at one or two excursions under the bubble, but otherwise they would be staying in the hotel. And uh, even uh, in the choice of uh, sites and attractions, it's uh, really very limited. Uh, mostly they are uh, national parks where the, the environment is more open or, or we selected the, the archaeological sites uh, that are open but uh, less uh, populated by the domestic tourists. And uh, only about two places are enclosed places that is the temple of tooth relic and the Dambulla temple, cave temple. Uh, which had to be selected due to the uh, very heavy demand on these two sites. Then the uh, yeah, lack of interaction with the community and then you can't just go out and buy a pink coconut or buy some fruits from the local vendor. Uh, so this, uh, this creates a lot of tension for the local communities as well. Then the additional cost, uh, like Sri Lanka was not branded as a high-end destination. It is. It was branded as a uh, low, low kind of uh, tourist destination. But may, this may be an opportunity for us to change our uh, position in the world because uh, we realize that even with the, the stringent guidelines and the additional costs involved, there, is, there still is a lot of uh, demand to come to Sri Lanka. Maybe we'll have to thank our excellent medical services that uh, you have managed to contain the COVID uh, pandemic to uh, a certain degree. Uh, more, more so than the so-called developed countries. Uh, therefore, uh, we have a lot of uh, inquiries coming in from uh, uh, part of Europe, uh, US, uh, India, uh, and uh, some Eastern Asian countries. Uh, then uh, there is this question about the PCR test for children. Uh, we have uh, made inquiries, but uh, still, I, I think we still haven't received any um, 
any decision on this whether uh, the children have to undergo the test uh, even if their parents are negative uh, this is uh, still under discussion and uh, then uh, they had issues about uh, finding authentic information about the uh, requirements the preparation and all that that is why uh, the sri lanka tourism created this uh, this platform to uh, get information uh, the guidelines and everything uh, so this hello again portal is uh, that gives all the the guidelines and uh, the information a tourist would need uh, even the sites that they can visit the times and the uh, even the contact details of all that is given in the site then uh, what do we tell our hoteliers the industry so there are uh, we are quite hard on the the hotel industry these uh, level 1 hotels have a lot of responsibility uh, how to uh, take care of their guests and not to breach this bubble and uh, we have conducted uh, many uh, trainings after the, we developed this operational guideline and uh, visited and inspected the places to see whether they are uh, following the guidelines given then uh, when now uh, we collect the information we uh, we have sent this uh, format to all the hotels and the two operators so they have to provide us uh, all this information about their guests uh, prior to uh, their visas are approved because at the moment uh, the even though the eta is open they wait for us uh, wait for our uh, uh, clearance to uh, issue the the visa and uh, we have made it mandatory because uh, this is a lesson that we learned from the pilot project uh, even though the mandatory pcrs are there the, the, some of the guests uh, refuse to uh, do the pcr uh, some said that uh, they don't have money for that they refuse to take so now uh, everything has to be prepaid and then a comprehensive um, covid uh, insurance cover has to be there so all this has to be prepared before they vote and uh, what are the issues uh, the dilemmas faced by the uh, tourist service provider one is the high cost involved with the safe and secure operation because the industry has been already battered battered means uh, well last year the the previous year 2019 we had the uh, east attack and due to the east attack our tourism industry uh, was down for a period then uh, with the covid-19 pandemic it's uh, it was almost flattened and then uh, they had this uh, responsibility of access control even even for a beach property uh, the beach is supposed to be a public property but then uh, we had to control the access uh, with the assistance of the <clears throat> uh, forces and the police because uh, you know very well that uh, the beach has been like the property of the beach boys and all these vendors so they have had their uh, dominance so it is very difficult to uh, uh, prevent interactions and we had to seek the assistance of the army in this case but it is not only the beach properties even in the inland properties uh, they have to have this uh, access control then uh, the lack of tourism infrastructure suitable tourism in infrastructure especially during uh, long travel in other countries uh, we see these uh, the, the service centers in uh, uh, all the in, in certain intervals and then uh, you you even your buses they have these uh, mobile to the toilets and all that but uh, 
in Sri Lanka, we don't have that kind of tourism infrastructure, and uh, therefore the planning this uh, excursion is a lot of. Uh, uh, it has to uh, a lot of coordination has to go into that, so they have to uh, tell us what is the itinerary where they are planning to stay, uh, like uh, stop for uh, refreshments uh, the, or the toilets. So we have to inform the health authorities, the COVID task force and the uh, area medical officers of their movement. So it's a lot of coordination work and uh, not an easy task. Then uh, for the service providers, the hoteliers, especially the mandatory quarantine period, they, they uh, even uh, like even if they don't have a single uh, COVID positive guest, uh, they are still required to quarantine their staff for 14 days. So uh, this is uh, quite an issue for the industry, and I don't know whether this could be uh, relaxed if the uh, tourism industry can be vaccinated, uh, that is uh, still open for discussion. And um, the other issue is the uh, PCR testing on arrival, because uh, we have been given the opportunity, thankfully, to uh, the health uh, ministry and the uh, DG that to conduct the PCR test outside the airport. So we were given uh, the opportunity to conduct the PCR test at the uh, designated hotel before checking. So uh, the hotels uh, have been instructed to uh, coordinate with the five hospitals and arrange facilities to uh, take the PCR test. But uh, that was uh, okay with the pilot project because uh, the arrivals were like 100 at a time. But when it it is uh, either two or three guests at a time, it is uh, a bit difficult for the hotelier to uh, invite this, uh, the, the private hospital and uh, tourists. So we are uh, discussing now we uh, put forward this proposal whether we can have a drive through uh, option uh, somewhere near the airport so we uh, we uh, uh, when, uh, from the arrival and the immigration clearance we take them to the drive through and get the samples taken and take them directly to the uh, designated hotel where they will remain like with minimum movements within their rooms until they get the result of the first PCR. That is a request from our side to you. And this, uh, for the tourism, Sri Lanka tourism, this is a, a real dilemma because uh, the real time monitoring uh, of uh, these tourists when they are arriving in smaller groups uh, and uh, who will be then uh, visiting certain sites. So uh, with our our staff, it's not possible to do this. So we have requested the tourist police as well as the um, uh, other forces to help us in this. And uh, we have brought them on board and uh, we have like, uh, we have developed this uh, mobile application as well as the a uh, web page solution, which is now under uh, security audit at the search. So we are hoping that this uh, application and the, the web-based solution is launched uh, at the earliest so that information sharing is very easy. Otherwise, at the moment, we are manually sharing all the information. And uh, that is a lot of uh, additional work for the limited number of uh, Staff. And uh, then the creation of uh, the public awareness. So uh, we are using the, the electronic media, the printed media, webinars, uh, awareness workshops, and uh, videos for awareness creation and uh, to, to uh, like uh, 
make them realize what are the responsibilities of the community because uh, this is not something that we can do uh, by force we have to realize that uh, if i know it is very difficult because uh, the health health uh, authorities have been doing this uh, uh, the awareness creation from the beginning but till we observe that uh, the moment of uh, like moment the health authorities look the other way the people will be relaxing too much and then uh, putting the entire uh, community uh, uh, into danger so uh, education awareness creation is good but we still have to have the enforcement uh, coupled with it then uh, i explain the and availability of the web link and uh, technology but uh, we we are hopeful that this step can be uh, fulfilled like uh, addressed very soon thank you very much so we hope that we can resume tourism but uh, without uh, breaching the bubble and damaging the community and we, our our main objective is that the international traveler does not uh, transmit it to our community and our community does not transmit it to the international traveler uh, your cooperation in this is very important you uh, we are very thankful to all the help given by the health authorities uh, thank you for inviting me to share this thought right uh, thank you uh, mrs vijay singh so now it's the time for questions and the answers so there's a burning question coming up in the chat uh, whether we are going to conduct this bio bubble for the school students also so i would like to send the question to all the all three eminent speakers so we'll be able to conduct a bio bubble Uh, for the school or are we going to have a small pilot project before starting the schools in the western province especially i think inoka will answer sir uh, yes uh, well and now actually uh, i suppose now already other uh, parts of sri lanka like other districts they have received the uh, schools to a certain time table and a plan and uh, uh, just to be uh, very honest with this actually it's the family health bureau who is responsible for schools so therefore uh, uh, since i'm coming from some other directorate i'm not very much sure about their plan uh, so whether they are going to conduct another pilot or i think even western province uh, certain uh, grades uh, they have commenced uh, as far as i know but in my opinion when it comes to a bio, bio bubble uh, now the group of persons inside a bio bubble actually needs a lot of discipline so i really don't know how we can apply it among school children because anyway they are very playful and uh, on the other hand you can't uh, sort of you know stick them in this bubble so other aspects also we need to look into uh, so i think in my opinion it's going to be uh, very difficult to uh, apply this bio bubble concept in schools but certainly we can plan the one sweep uh, but you need a lot of discipline i really don't know whether we can get it because especially the small children but certainly for high, uh, the, the the older ones we can try Uh, to my knowledge you know ka uh, can't uh, you have the bubble per class yes you can madam but only thing is they have to ensure that they adhere to the the bubble so now when it comes to industrial setting of course there is lot of discipline and in fact in the industries uh, even recently they have hired like protocol officers especially is uh, army retired person so that you know they 
monitor these things and then they ensure that discipline is there inside. But you can, but on the other hand, madam, now when it comes to classes even, so there is going to be mixing up between the interval and when they go to the uh, canteen and when they have physical uh, activity and all that. So you need to very carefully plan it. One thing, of course, that should not harm the learning process. And also, you need to ensure that they practice it by monitoring it. So I really don't know how we can do it, especially in a school setting where uh, things are not, uh, the things are scarce, especially the teachers also, they must be having a lot of uh, uh, activity. So, but certainly we can try it with the older ones because we can make them somehow understand the situation. Smaller ones is going to be really difficult. Yeah, uh, thank you, madam. Uh, so there's another question coming up. Uh, whether uh, this bio bubble will break when these people go to their hostels or the boarding places or home. So can you uh, explain a little bit on that situation, how this works, uh, especially in, in the apparel industry? Uh, yes, actually, that's a very good uh, question. So that is why I mentioned it's a modified bio bubble that we are practicing. So ideally, in the ideal situation, of course, the accommodation too has to be considered in a bio bubble, and then they, the, the uh, so the accommodation, everything has to be considered, and then they should be in a bubble. But now, what we have done is now, of course, the employees they need to go home, but most of the places the transportation is provided, so we apply this bio bubble even up to the transportation level. But once they go home, yes, there is breaching of the bubble. So what we do is the next day when they come, we have advised the enterprises to screen them thoroughly. So uh, just to explain how this screening happens. Uh, now, we have already sent simple questionnaires and this uh, at the enterprise level before the people or the employees are boarded to the bus. They are being screened, so they have appointed leaders. And then each bus will have a leader. So they will screen the employees with regards to symptoms of COVID-19. And if they have anything, they will not get them on board. So that happens at the entry. And again, when they come to the plant level, again, another screening will be conducted uh, with the temperature screening, all that. And inside, again, uh, around 12 noon or so, the nurse uh, who is in most of these enterprises, they will go another round checking whether they have symptoms. And sometimes in like, you know, the, the, the very uh, good uh, disciplined ones, they will have another round. So uh, how this breaching of bio bubble, when it comes to accommodation, we try to catch up by screening them at different points so that there is less contamination. And even if there is contamination, all these screenings would help us to identify it at an initial stage so that we can really plan the containment. And there is not going to be a disastrous spread in the industry. Right. Uh, thank you, madam. So there's another question asking whether there is a limitation for a particular bubble the number of people, and also is there a, any monitoring system like external evaluators? That means uh, for this number of uh, apparel workers, okay, we will appoint this number of uh, PHIs. Is there a ratio like that for a monitoring system? That uh, you, you have mentioned that uh, there are monitoring system in that particular organization, but uh, we are asking uh, whether there are external evaluators also. Yes. Now, actually, like the epidemiology unit who is in charge of all this epidemiology, the Family Health Bureau uh, in charge of uh, the Family Health Program, uh, in the Ministry of Health, uh, there is this Directorate of Environment and Occupational Health formed, and the Directorate of Environmental Health and Occupational Health is responsible for Occupational Health Program of the Ministry of Health. So, actually, I'm um, the technical consultant uh, responsible for that program. 
and then we have devised monetary mechanisms. So as you very correctly mentioned, there is a kind of a very strict monitoring process that is happening inside the industries and externally also we monitor it. Now, usually any program at the national level, we implement it to the provinces, districts, and finally to the MOHS. And of course, when it comes to environment and occupational health, it's the public health inspector. So that is how we implement things at the ground level. Now, there is a monitoring mechanism because we have already sent circulars asking the medical officers of health and the public health inspectors, especially to concentrate on these export processing industries and where they need to go there, like, you know, every week or so. So we have sent them checklists uh, and then they use this checklist to monitor these things. But unfortunately, when the second wave happened, we um, tried to understand why that happened and we saw gaps in this monitoring process. I, I, I mean, our health staff, they are almost like, you know, overburdened with COVID-19 uh, when it starts uh, since its inception. So then, of course, we thought we should have parallel monitoring mechanisms. So therefore, we have uh, designed this monitoring process where we monitor the industries and enterprises from the national level also. So for that, what we did was we identified focal points, especially from this export-oriented uh, manufacturing and apparel industries, focal points from each plant. So we have databases at the national level, and then especially these souls, we have uh, all the details, and then we are communicating with them, and we have given them checklists. So there is a mechanism where they need to submit this checklist, the summary forms to the zonal directors. Zonal directors, they send the feedback to us. And on the other hand, we have sent daily, um, what we call is a Google alert, where we know whether we, they are practicing these things, whether they have um, positive workers also. So there are parallel systems that we have implemented. We are monitoring them externally as well as through our public health system, as well as directly from the directorate. Uh, so that is how we are doing it currently. Right. Uh, thank you, madam. Any uh, comments from our senior professor, uh, Arjuna Silva? Um, Sadiq, uh, could I speak to Arjuna, ask a question? Yeah. Uh, now, um, as the way it was mentioned by Ajna that this has to be the, the success depends on the number of tests, 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 tests. So with regard to PCR, now there were uh, many uh, doubts initially. We said that uh, if PCR is positive, I mean, in, in 14 days, the disease becomes negative. But then much later, we said that PCR continues to be positive. So I just would like to know, Arjuna, when they have been doing this PC, this much frequent PCRs, I mean, once you analyze them, was there any data that could be, uh, you, that could be useful for, I mean, say, if you extrapolate that to our day-to-day -day clinical practice, I mean, with regard to how, for how long that P, this PCR would remain positive, and how early that it would disappear, because uh, as the way that Arjuna said that, I mean, if the third PCI in nine days becomes negative, the player is allowed to play. So was there any information that we could gather to extrapolate that for our day-to-day -day, uh, decision making? Yeah, uh, until Dr. Arjuna uh, comes up. So I would like to ask another question. Uh, can we apply this biobubble concept to the hospital, especially for the uh, cancer hospital, patients who are receiving their chemotherapies and the hemodialysis units? Can we apply this biobubble concept for that? Dr. Inoka? <laughs> yes, I think because the even though we might not be able to apply the full biobubble concept, but as I mentioned, uh, what we have done for this apparel and the industrial sectors, we certainly can apply the biobubble concept, especially uh, in terms of hospital treatment as well. So therefore, uh, we can reduce contamination and uh, that can be applied. 
Yeah, uh, madam, there's another question coming up. Uh, if a member of the tour group is found to be positive, are the others in the group uh, sent for quarantine? Uh, well, I think uh, Tamika would be able to answer that. Uh, yeah. Yes, doctor. Uh, according to the guidelines given to us, um, if a group is uh, uh, like first first uh, instance uh, when the first uh, PCR is done, only the uh, the close interactions will be uh, isolated. Uh, that is, uh, for the first uh, until the first, uh, result of the first PCR is received, uh, they will stay in their smaller groups like family or the, the close contact. So them and the uh, staff that have been uh, in close contact with them will be isolated. That is what happened uh, with the pilot project. Uh, not the entire group. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would li I like to ask another one. Uh, are you all happy about the this Ukraine bio bubble concept or any things that we have to learn? Any breaching points and any troubleshootings? Yeah, uh, as I explained uh, from the beginning, because uh, it was it came to us uh, without really uh, real planning because uh, it was forced on us actually, but then. <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of uh, communication gaps at that moment. So uh, they arrived in Sri Lanka and said that they were not aware that they had to go through a free PCR test within the country and uh, they refused. So uh, for the first two groups actually um, we had to keep them without going out for any excursions because uh, they refused that to do the PCR afterwards. On arrival, they did, but then the next they did. So uh, then uh, that is why I said that we had to escalate it to the very top and then uh, get some uh, serious advice, <laughs> uh, troubleshoot. So I have, but uh, I'm uh, glad to say that uh, after that very first incident, the, all the travel agents were very cooperative. They uh, diligently uh, sent us the reports and the, the prior, like, prior information so that we could share it with the health authorities and the COVID task force and all other relevant. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Uh, another question coming up. Uh, can we vaccinate our tourist uh, industry people? So will it be helpful uh, to minimize our long-term cost-wise for the these prevention strategies? Is there a plan like that? Yeah, well, yes, that we have requested from the uh, health authorities and uh, actually the president and the COVID task force. So uh, what we have been told is that according to the uh, WHO, they have the priorities, the uh, frontline health workers then the uh, the forces and then the vulnerable group. Uh, but then we have requested at least 200,000 for uh, vaccinations to be uh, allocated to the tourism industry frontliners. Uh, I don't know whether that could be uh, allocated, but uh, so that at least uh, we can reduce some of the, the suicide factors. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Vijay Singh. Another question came up just now. Uh, they're asking uh, if a one tour is positive on arrival after a long flight, what will happen to the other air passengers? I think uh, it was mentioned before in the lecture also, but I would be pleased if you can uh, yeah, re elaborate so on that. This has been discussed at the COVID task force because the, the airline doctors, uh, Dr. Bimal, explained to us that the uh, vertical, vertical air circulation that exists within a flight is uh, quite different from uh, the horizontal air circulation we experience inside a room or uh, normal, uh, normal, normal circumstances. And they have these uh, HEPA filters, high efficiency filters that purify and uh, 
calculate that like the external layer is taken in and then the internal layer is uh, taken out of the flight. So the, the uh, contamination is less. So uh, they are cleaning the, because this is more uh, like, uh, it's not airborne mostly, it is uh, droplets and uh, that uh, creates the transmission. So they clean the inside of the uh, airplane most of the time. So, uh, they said the uh, they have been uh, there have been some studies and uh, the uh, chance of uh, transmitting it from one passenger to the other is less than transmitting it within a uh, enclosed room. Right. Uh, is there a protocol for us? for a tourist who's returning who has already received the complete shots of the vaccine what what are we going to do with them yeah we have uh, asked that question from the health authorities you lo you all will have to tell us that we have requested the uh, uh, protocol yeah, Dr. Uh, Inoka? For... i think as far as i know even though they have according to uh, 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 what they say currently, even though they have uh, got the vaccine, still they have to undergo this uh, quarantine. Yeah, actually, what we have been told is that uh, when you get the vaccine, you experts uh, will have to uh, uh, confirm this uh, that even though you have had the vaccine, uh, well, you will be protected, but the chance of you uh, transmitting it to somebody else is there. Therefore, uh, the, the fact that the tourist is vaccinated will not help if uh, our uh, unless our people are vaccinated. So if both parties are vaccinated, maybe we can relax, relax the testing. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratne, are there any questions from your side? Um, no, not for the time. No, I don't think. Thank you. Uh, the audience, do you all have any other questions? So you can unmute and directly ask the questions from the expert panel, or you can send it uh, through the chat. So if there are no questions, we can wind up for today. So if you have any questions, we can unmute and ask directly. Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, what about the local tourism? I mean, how are we, is there any, situation or system for that? Well, uh, the domestic tourism is governed by the guidelines given by the health authorities, but the uh, protocol with the international tourism is that uh, you can't mix the domestic tourists and the local tourists, the international tourists at uh, any uh, point. That is why we have like, even for uh, sites, approved sites like Sibiria or uh, Tandamaliga, where they have identified different time slots for the people, uh, the international travelers, and the, the different routes so that the interactions will be minimum. Therefore, uh, whatever the guidelines that applies to the, the, the domestic population applies to the domestic tourists, while the, the international tourists are kept within this bubble. Any other questions? So is there a strategy or a plan to promote uh, the domestic tourism rather than bringing people from abroad uh, to at least to uplift this tourism sector up to a certain extent? Is there a strategy or a plan to promote the local tourism? So where the small, these tourist uh, hotels, the small, not, not the big ones, the small tourist hotels can at least survive. Is there a plan like that to promote the uh, local tourism? Yeah, the local uh, campaign is also going on. Like it's, uh, it's been uh, rolled out that uh, the industry cannot just survive on the domestic domestic tourism because that happens most of the time only during weekends or school holidays. It's uh, mm -hmm. very rare that uh, during the weekdays that uh, they will be yeah, engaged yeah. in. Uh, I think uh, it's it's uh, more suppressed than encouraged because that we are uh, asked to avoid gatherings. I mean, it's more often that the families get together and go on tours, isn't it? So 
I think uh, uh, in the today's context, uh, the traveling is more suppressed than sort of promoted. So definitely. Yeah, exactly, doctor. And, and then after the second wave, uh, most people were uh, quite reluctant to uh, travel. Like. Otherwise, uh, after the like the initial uh, lapse, then it was trying uh, about to pick up because uh, there were a lot of uh, these card promotions and various other promotions. But then after October, it's like completely uh, down. Uh, this is uh, something out of this topic. Uh, for a percentage wise, do you all have any uh, amounts uh, saying that how many people have lost their jobs because of the this pandemic in the tourism sector? Any percentage wise? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, we haven't exactly calculated, but it is uh, not just a job doctor, because yeah. uh, it's, it's about uh, 300,000 people who are directly employed. And for uh, mm -hmm. for their job security, we took a lot of uh, measures. We introduced this wage support scheme and then the uh, various uh, concessions and then uh, the like uh, sometimes uh, one off grant for the industry. But the thing is, the loss of income for the uh, indirect uh, dependents, because there are a lot of like people in the supply chain from the family seller to the, uh, the egg supplier, the vegetable fruit suppliers, and uh, the cleaners, the laundry, everything. So, there are a lot of uh, people who are indirectly in engaged in like tourism, the, the small vendors, the beach boys, everything. So uh, it's not exactly a loss of job, but loss of income. Uh, Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, uh, uh, this, uh, of course, that I know that uh, Sri Lanka standard institution is uh, being implemented COVID-19 system certification scheme so that uh, I would like to know whether that scheme will be benefited to the uh, hotel industry where you can further promote the hoteliers to get the certification and ensure that their places are safely managed to attract the tourists. Well, at the beginning when we started this, uh, the, uh, after the, the, we developed this operational guideline and started to uh, like uh, do the auditing, we reached out to the standard institution, but uh, they said that because uh, the auditing team was uh, supposed to do the independent audit and then the training as well. So uh, they said that they can't take it. Yeah, that is why we had to go to the private sector independent auditors to get this work done. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, Padma, this is Arjuna Aduhari speaking. Yes, sir. Uh, I have three concerns. One is that vaccination hasn't been around for long enough, and the percentage success of vaccination is very variable. And so to use vaccination in any way to measure anything or decide anything at this stage is probably premature. That's one comment. Second comment is that it would be nice to see if these various options that you have described, if they haven't already been costed, if they can be costed so that it will help people to decide which option to take and that this costing can be publicly available so that the people who live in this country also can be aware of the financial implications of what they may or may not do. Um, the last question is in a very stupid one, I think Padma will say, and that is whether the information technology facilities are being used to the very maximum to record and communicate, record what's happening in individual groups, 
as a groups to communicate or com communicate to the center or with each other or something like that. Is the internet being used at the very maximum so that paperwork is reduced? End of questions or comments. Thanks. Doctor, if I may comment on the the last question, it is not at all a stupid question because it is uh, very important. That is why I, I told you about this uh, web-based solution and the uh, mobile app is, is being developed because uh, so prior uh, prior to their departures, they can uh, submit us the information about their, their itineraries and uh, the health records, everything. Therefore, uh, we can be more prepared and that information will be immediately, when, when they submit that information, it will be shared with the, uh, the like, uh, let's say if somebody is coming from England and the, that person is going to Hampanthutu, so the, immediately that area medical officer will be informed that such and such a person from England is coming and we will be staying in your uh, area for this length of time. So and then their movements, uh, uh, everything, and then also there is the the uh, complaint uh, management system where they can uh, make a complaint or uh, 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 then uh, redress handling. So all that is being incorporated into this uh, technological uh, solution. So I think uh, IT ICT can help a lot in this kind of a situation. To add to that, uh, I think uh, very correctly mentioned, even we are using ICT, uh, especially in our day-to-day -day work as well, because we have uh, usually what we do is we get down these returns and things, but now we are going for innovative uh, uh, measures, even like, you know, having WhatsApp group and uh, uh, this Google alert sheet. So I think that is... Uh, one area that we need to uh, sort of use uh, just to be, uh, uh, to uh, like you know uh, control this uh, pandemic. And uh, the second question is also quite valid because we need to cost these things so that everyone can understand why they should be using or should not be using. Uh, I think that's a very valid point, uh, uh, sir. You made so maybe especially in the industrial sector, this can be very important. Why? Because we can convince the others who have not adopted certain measures to implement these things in their settings as well. So if they really see the, the cost benefit analysis. So uh, yes, that's a very good solution. We need to do that. Right. Uh, since there are no other questions, uh, so we will be coming to the end of our sessions today. So our session was the biobubble in the new normal concept. So I would like to thank Dr. Inoka Suravira and Mrs. Dhammika Vijaysingha and our Vidya Jyoti Senior Professor uh, Dr. Arjuna De Silva. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, sharing your ideas, the discussions, sharing your knowledge among us and help us to uh, uplift the knowledge on this new concept of biobubble. Uh, we learned a lot and we are expecting your continuous help to SLMA in future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And have a good night. Good night.